All right, so welcome to today's lecture on uh, deep learning. Uh, this is the third and final lecture of the third module on uh, regulatory genomics and networks. We learned about um, network structure and regulatory motifs the last two lectures. Today we're going to learn about a very different type of network, namely um, learning network. So uh, the network is not the structure that we're trying to learn. It is the structure with which we're learning all kinds of other things. So we're going to talk about first supervised learning with neural networks. Then we're going to talk about unsupervised learning with deep belief networks and autoencoders. And we're going to learn about modern deep learning architectures, so autoencoders, convolutional neural nets, recurrent neural nets. Then we're going to turn to biology and look at deep learning and regulatory genomics. And then uh, we're going to look at some very practical issues about how you can implement your own deep learning models using all kinds of cool engines and environments that you can use. Let's start with uh, neural networks. So uh, we're going to talk about where they're coming from and how do they learn. And in particular, um, the inspiration of neural networks is that inside our brain, there must be some kind of infrastructure for being able to learn and recognize patterns. So it's easy for us to recognize a handwritten number two. Uh, even though it can vary dramatically, or had written number three, or five, uh, or four. And um, this is something that humans can do very, very well, even though they're dramatically different characters from each other. So how can we do that? Well, back in the 60s, people said, uh, let's try to study how the brain actually works. And maybe we can build computational structures that mimic the architecture of the human brain, which is just so malleable and able to learn so many different things. So what we realize is that every neuron has basically, you know, uh, one long axon that basically connects out onto um, the next uh, activation uh, layer, and it, it receives a bunch of inputs. So, and it does some kind of operation, some kind of function to compute on those inputs. So the concept of this artificial perception was, was built of basically computing some kind of function z as an output of integrating a lot of different inputs. So basically every input xi is coming into this from possibly other artificial perceptions. Can you see better now? And there's a kind of summing operation that gets um, you know, uh, achieved there. And there's a weighing operation, these little red um, circles are weighing every one of these inputs. So basically, it's a weighted sum of inputs with some kind of you know, baseline B. And then the output is uh, somehow then transformed from this operation through an activation function that we're going to see in the next slide. And the whole concept is that any one perceptron is not you know, too interesting by itself. But when you start stacking them, you can actually start approximating almost any kind of function. So then the idea is that you can have one or more output units that basically predict something. For example, I see the number two and it's red. And that could be sort of the two different outputs that I have. And then the inputs could be a bunch of pixels projected on the back of my retina. And in the middle, you basically have all these hidden units that allow you to um, abstract away from that initial input. So basically the key idea is that you're not looking at the raw input, but somehow you're combining and combining and combining as you go up the layers, multiple such inputs in a hierarchical fashion that allows you to then compute extremely complex functions. And in fact, these deep multi-layer neural networks can learn to approximate almost any function, which is remarkable. So by basically coupling together these very simple perceptrons, into these very repetitive networks, you can truly learn extremely complex input output functions. Everybody with me? So this is the basis of neural networks. And now, as I mentioned earlier, after you've done this sum of all of these weighted inputs, you then have an activation function. So what is that activation function? That basically tells you how much information does my particular neuron need to receive before it then fires off on its own? And that's what that activation function does. And basically the idea is that if I'm not receiving anything, I'm not outputting anything. 
And then at some point, I'm, cre I'm crossing this activation threshold above which I'm basically firing. Everybody comfortable with this? So that's the traditional neural network. That's a sigmoid unit. It basically takes an input, it transforms it according to the sigmoid function, and it maps it to a zero one decision of whether the neuron is firing or not. It's basically involving a lot of different, um, you know, a range of input, and it's outputting either a zero or a one based on that. Alternative functions are possible, and in fact, they're much more common nowadays. Uh, in particular, a softmax function, which is basically taking this form, and this allows you to output not just between zero and one, but continue outputting the input after a certain level of activation. So at first, you're not outputting anything, and then you're starting to activate, and then boom, what you output is actually the input. Okay, so that's the green function here, the softmax. And then modern um, neural networks are basically using this rectified linear unit. So it's kind of like a softmax in the sense that it's zero for most of the input ranges, it's linear for most of the you know, input ranges. And then in the middle, instead of making a smooth transition, it basically makes a hard transition. How? By effectively taking positive numbers only, uh, or zero, 15, so zero, and then one. Everybody's super comfy with these nonlinear activation units. So what they allow us to do is instead of having a massive linear function where everything will just vary as soon as you vary any one of the inputs, you basically now have activation thresholds below which you're not firing at all and above which you're now firing uh, a lot. Everybody with me? So how do we now learn in these networks? So we basically saw the building blocks, the perceptron, the layers, the activation units, sigmoid, softmax, or relu. Uh, rectifier linear unit. Uh, and then what we'd like to do now is actually learn. So how do we learn these extremely complex functions? The way that you learn uh, in a neural network setting is supervised learning. So you basically have some kind of output that you're trying to achieve, and then you're learning a set of weights that will make your network output that function that you're giving it as the training example, uh, using the input examples. So the idea is that, again, you're trying to sort of learn an output from a set of inputs, and then you're going to adjust the weight throughout your network based on the deltas of what you're trying to achieve. Okay? So this is known as gradient learning. You're using derivatives of this learning function to effectively update your weight at time t based on your weight at time t minus 1 and some kind of gradient. That I'm learning. What is that gradient? That gradient is, of course, scaled by a learning rate, which allows you to learn faster or slower. And it basically uh, uses the partial derivative along the dimension of w for your error function. So your error function is basically the difference between what you're trying to predict and what you're currently predicting. So if you're trying to output a seven and you're at a six, then that's you know, how much my output is changing as a function of my weight to ensure that this previous weight is actually decaying to basically avoid having, you know, explosive uh, functions. And then you can also add a momentum that basically said, if I changed in the previous time step in this particular direction, then I'm going to keep that momentum going. Okay? Who's with me with this formula? Are you guys following? Great. So... This is what uh, gradient descent does. It basically takes this partial derivative of the, of the error with respect to w. Uh, epsilon is a scaling uh, by the learning rate. This can usually be small, and it's needed not to overshoot the optimal solution. There's a weight decay that penalizes large weights to prevent overfitting. And there's a momentum, which is based on the magnitude and the sign of the previous update, delta wt minus 1. When the direction of the update is consistent, this leads to faster convergence. You can also train using only a subset of samples at a time. Instead of using all of your samples each time, what you can basically do is stochastic gradient descent. Instead of gradient descent, basically do stochastic gradient descent. And that can speed up the computation. How? By effectively randomly sampling a subset of your input and then updating the weights using only that subset. And that turns out to be extremely powerful, actually, in practice. And this basically approximates uh, learning different functions on your input. We're going to see different versions of that. There's a version of that where 
instead of zeroing out different inputs, what you do is that you zero out different nodes in the middle of your network. A version of the stochastic gradient descent is online learning, where you update the gradient using only one training point each time. So you do this at every single perception along this neural network, and then you're combining them by basically doing backpropagation. So there's a forward pass, where you're taking your input and you're calculating all of your changes as you go along, and then there's a backward pass where you take all these partial derivatives and you backpropagate these differences from the uh, top layer all the way down to the input layer. Everybody with me? Great. So now let's talk about how are we navigating this function. We're talking about this gradient descent. What do we call it gradient descent? Because there's kind of function that's basically a field that I find out, which basically tells you what are my parameters and what is the setting that gives me the setting of the weights, say on this dimension, that dimension. So I'm setting weight one and weight two. Of course, that's a multidimensional object. But there's some combination of weight one and weight two that basically gives me a maximally correct output. Okay, this is just the error surface. So they call it gradient descent because there's a gradient that you're descending along to sort of minimize that error. Okay, so basically, provided that the objective function, uh, this error is concave, at each iteration, the error derivatives will decrease the distance between the current weight vector from every local optimum solution i.e. the feasible solution, and by a finite number of updates, the weight vector must reach one of these local optimums. Okay? So that's the, that's the key idea, because every single time you're taking those derivatives, you're constantly minimizing the error. Of course, you're not walking always in a straight line. Notice here, I'm taking a step that certainly minimizes my error, but I'm not always walking in the same direction. I'm, I'm sort of zigzagging my way up the hill, kind of like most hills. Um, so there's a lot of challenges associated with learning and with gradient descent. So basically, if the option, if the most solution space is very narrow, then your conversions might be very slow because every single time you're overshooting that solution, you're going back and forth. And the learning rate must be small in order to avoid overshooting. There's numerical approximations of the gradient that can uh, basically step in uh, incorrect solutions. So basically, if when you're computing your delta, you have slight errors because of floating precision, for example, of your machine, then you might just be slightly off in that direction. And therefore, if your learning rate is too big, you might actually completely overshoot or just shooting the wrong direction. Uh, you might overfit. If there's too many parameters and too few training examples, you might just find a local optimum, optimum that does not generalize. Also, of course, a lot of time to learn bigger steps. But if you take bigger steps, you learn faster because your network is bigger, you might end up shooting in the wrong directions. So the last thing is that. What I told you about was with a fixed network architecture. And sometimes you need to actually learn the network of the architecture itself. You need to learn how many layers you would like, how many perceptions you would like for layers, and so, on and so forth. And these are hyperparameters that should also be learned. So basically, there's an outer loop of learning that sometimes can sort of complicate matters. I mentioned this earlier in terms of dropping out individual examples. You can also simply drop out individual neurons, individual perceptrons. So basically, if, you know, if you're trying to train a very deep model, you have a huge, huge number of updates to make. One way to speed it up is to actually be very sloppy and just forget half of them each time or just a big fraction of them. And um, the, the key is that if you're using a lot of networks, network, each of which is... Did you notice how long it's... I think it's still recording. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, and then, you know, there's interesting connections with Bayesian neural networks as well. Uh, so the result of this dropout learning is that instead of getting stuck at some, uh, you know, uh, threshold of performance, with dropout, you can actually get unstuck and you can actually go further down. And that's because you're exploring more of the space by sort of, you know, moving out of these local minima. You're, you know, you're constantly shifting your model right and left, and that actually allows you to get unstuck from these local minima. There's another uh, big issue with learning, which is that these neural networks are extremely powerful. They can truly, truly learn any function. And if you only have four points to fit, they can learn a function that goes up and down and zigzag through the points and matches them exactly and perfectly. But the problem there is that your generalization will be very low. In other words, your performance in a new example that wasn't part of your training set will be horrible. 
And this is actually what happens. So as you're training, your performance on the training set in blue continues to decrease. And that's great. But your performance on the on the uh, on on a new example, in fact, uh, gets worse. So the error actually at some point starts increasing. So the question is, how far should you train? And the answer is, well, until the green line starts going uphill, okay? Until the green line starts getting a higher uh, error. Can you maybe log on to this to make sure that you can also uh, see? Yeah, just to make sure, yeah, you can use the usual one, just to make sure that, you know, everything is in order. Does that make sense? So basically, and then the gap here is effectively your generalization gap. You can do great in your training set, but at some point you're gonna be making things worse in your testing set. So one way to do that is to actually include a validation set. So, you know, part of your training data is set aside, small part of it, as your validation set. And as soon as your performance in your validation set starts getting worse, you know that you should no longer trying to improve performance on the training set. Does that make sense? Uh, just go to uh, the usual URL that I sent. Every, everybody with me with sort of how to stop early? All right, so that's the basis of uh, neural networks and what neural networks have been about for the last, you know, I don't know, 50 years or so. So perceptrons, you know, laid out in multiple layers, these activation units, and then gradient descent, backpropagation, adjusting the rate, using, you know, dropout, and then avoiding overfitting. Okay, everybody with me so far? So you guys have covered like 40 years of research. This um, now, let's talk about what happened in the last few years, because neural networks had this dramatic revival over the last few years. And there's many things that contributed to this revival. On one hand, more data. So just, just massive, massive, massive data sets. Because as we mentioned, these networks are so powerful, they can learn any function. But because they're so powerful, because they have so much uh, power, you need a lot of examples. Otherwise, you're going to be overfitting with your examples. So massive, massive data. Number two, they're extremely expensive to train. So there's been a lot of improvement in hardware that have actually allowed, you know, thousands of machines to be streamlined together, you know, GPUs and so on and so forth, to basically allow just very, very rapid running of these gradient design operations. And then the third thing that happened is new algorithms. So basically, and, and that's what we're going to talk about now. So the first thing is that supervised, that neural networks are very, very good at supervised learning. You better have an annotation. But what if you don't have an annotation? How can we learn as humans? When we walk around as babies, nobody's there to constantly tell us, wall, 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 don't fall there, wall, wall. We're somehow learning that, oh, yeah, there's these different types of objects around us. In a way, our neural networks are let loose in the world, and somehow they learn the concept of a chair and a table and a wall and a person and a space and so on and so forth. The way that we do that is completely unsupervised. We don't have somebody constantly telling us what is what. And there's uh, architectures of these neural networks that have been developed specifically for these types of problems. One very powerful search architecture is a general Boltzmann machine, which basically allows unsupervised learning. So here's what this does. It has a bunch of hidden units, just like the neural network that we talked about earlier. But it doesn't have an output. It only has hidden units. And it, of course, also has input units. And this is a very symmetrically connected network. Every binary unit makes some stochastic on-off decision as to whether it's going to turn on or turn off. And that allows you to now use different combinations of your inputs. And the network weights learn relationships between your variables. So as you give this Boltzmann machine a bunch of different variables and a bunch of different examples, it basically learns relationships between them. It kind of like learns the shape of that space without actually having a target output. So the configuration of that space basically dictates its energy, 
basically just, you know, just how much entropy it has. And at equilibrium, at minimum energy, it basically follows this Boltzmann distribution here, which is an exponentiated negative uh, energy entropy. And that energy is basically dependent on both the observed and the hidden nodes. Okay. So who's with me so far? Basically, what we've changed is that we no longer have an output. And we have now this thermodynamic interpretation that allows us to actually um, learn these weights that somehow capture uh, the relationships between these values. So your energy is basically uh, dictated by this function, which has uh, both visible and hidden units. EVH is your uh, energy function. And WIJ are your connecting weights every pair of nodes, whether they're hidden or observed, um, you have some kind of um, hidden or visible, you have some kind of weight. And then SI and SJ are the state of that unit. Am I on or am I off? And it's a probabilistic situation. Basically, you're never fully you know, going zero or one, but you have a probability associated with being in a state zero in a state one. And then you also have a bias for each of those, which you don't need to worry about. Uh, so then, yeah, correct, correct. Basically what you're doing is you're randomly initializing the weights and then you're updating them to somehow learn the function that relates these variables. So then your probability is effectively the energy of the system summed over you know, your hidden variables divided by the total energy of the system, which is also summed over the observed variable. Okay? And this is just a normalization factor to make sure that that adds up to one. Okay? So you're basically trying to minimize this total energy of the system. And uh, you know, by exponentiating this negative energy, you're effectively maximizing that. Okay? So that's what Boltzmann machines do. And the goal is, again, given your visible input over many examples, to learn the weights that maximize this P of E. And what's really cool is that these Boltzmann machines basically become a universal approximator of probability mass functions over discrete variables. So no matter what your variables look like, no matter what that probability mass function looks like, they have the power to actually learn it by you know, adding a sufficient number of hidden units and edges. With me so far? This is kind of cool, right? You're sort of learning about all of these different tools that you can use. And then, you know, hopefully by the end of the lecture, it will come together into sort of how we can actually use them in practice. But the advantage is that your learning rules are very local. Every single node only depends on sort of the weights of the surrounding nodes and their values. You infer each variable based on its neighbors only, and there's no need for uh, example annotations. There's no output function. The problem is that these are actually difficult to train. And the reason they're so difficult to train is because there are actually dependencies between the hidden units. Every single time you update this hidden unit, it's going to mess up that hidden unit and vice versa. And that actually leads to a lot of challenge in training. What you can do is how weights between hidden units and also eliminate the weights between visible units because these are actually not needed. What that results in is a restricted Boltzmann machine. Can you check? Um, so these restricted Boltzmann machines are simply restricted to be a bipartite graph, where half of your graph is hidden units, the other half of your graph is visible units, and the connections are only between hidden and visible units. Fully connected graph, but it's bipartite only. Everybody with me so far? So uh, there's no HH and no, no hidden hidden, no visible visible connection. It's only hidden visible. There's one layer of hidden units, one layer of visible units. And there's a very, you know, this basically cre creates a very simple unsupervised learning module. And this turns out to be much easier to train than these generalized Boltzmann machines. And the reason is that there's no circularities. Basically, every single time I learn one of them, I don't have to update the other hidden units. And then the objective function is shown here. Uh, again, you know, Browse the details at your own uh, interest. Uh, and this is, once more, uh, too large to estimate directly. You can't just simply take that whole function and optimize it. You can't take all of these uh, you know, derivatives and compute them directly. But what you can do instead is 
sample through the states of that system. So what we're going to do is we're going to use Gibbs sampling, the same thing that we saw in motif finding, and we're going to apply Markov chain Monte Carlo or MCMC for sampling. And what that allows me to do is now start updating only one of these nodes uh, at a time. Okay, we're going to come back to that momentarily. So once I have created my two layers, I can then be more creative. I can actually start learning higher level abstractions by stacking more and more layers of hidden units. The same exact way that my perceptrons were basically stacked into layers that were learning higher and higher levels of abstraction, starting from you know, pixels, and then learning edges, and then learning circles, and then learning you know, eyes and noses and ears before you start recognizing faces. In the same way, you can actually create these stacks of restricted Boltzmann machines. So have an input layer, which is basically pixels, and then a first layer of hidden nodes, and then a second layer of that, and a third layer, and so on and so forth. And when you stack these RBMs, you're basically creating something that's known as a deep belief network. So you first apply this RBM, it finds a sensible set of weights using your unlabeled data, and then you use these pre-trained uh, weights, basically add additional layers. And then at the end of all that, you can then perhaps add your training examples or your you know, task all the way at the end. So that allows the system to, in a completely unsupervised way, learn these intermediate um, levels of abstraction simply by understanding the shape of the distribution of the relationships of the input data without any training. And then only at the end, if you want, you can actually stack up a training example again. Everybody with me so far? So these networks are actually generative networks. And that's a very big step from the perceptrons and then the traditional neural networks that were only discriminative. So the original uh, neural networks were basically saying, I have a training example and I'm going to discriminate between this class and that class. Whereas now, what we have is the ability to. Um, am I still sharing my screen? Can you make sure that the screen is being shared? So, what I have now is the ability to actually learn the model forward. It's not? So it's not being, it's not sharing the screen. No, it seems that I'm sharing. Share. Oh no, I'm not. Okay. Can you turn it so that I can check on it? Okay, perfect, good, beautiful. Um, all right, so everybody with me so far? So basically what we've learned is how, you know, we can actually take these general Boltzmann machines, which were fully connected, and then avoid having any hidden to hidden uh, connections or visible to visible connections, and then use that to start stacking them up, and then create an unsupervised way of actually learning these hidden representations of the data. So let's click and actually see an example of uh, how this works. So um, for example, if the system is actually trying to learn a particular character, you can actually see how these uh, input pixels are in fact firing and updating this multi-layer architecture and how that's um, in turn resulting in sort of a classifier that tells you, well, which of these uh, characters are you more likely to be firing? So if I do that with say this character here, It will basically sort of learn a set of weights 
And based on that, it will start firing uh, in this particular direction and then learning whether, uh, you know, particular um, characters are actually being learned. You can actually see here the system in practice. And then, you know, this is the classification of which of these neurons uh, is actually firing. And you can see it's hesitating between a two and a three, which corresponds to these guys. And then in the end, it actually converges towards a three. And then it actually switches to a five sometimes. It's kind of cool, right? So you, you can sort of see how that network is uh, working. You can do that for any training example. Okay, so here's some of these outputs. So basically you can, because it's a generative system, you can actually generate characters by sampling from that hidden space. And then you can actually run deep sampling across different iterations to basically end up with, you know, this improvement of the weights and convergence towards uh, So how do we do the learning? So first of all, these Boltzmann machines have the advantage of actually having an energy representation. So there's a thermodynamic interpretation of this equilibrium. And what we're trying to do is actually find an equilibrium state where the probability distribution basically settles down. This is not an, an energy equilibrium where the system settles in the lowest energy configuration. This is where the probability uh, distribution settles. And at high temperature, you're, you're going to end up being able to overcome these jumps more easily. You're going to be jumping from this state to that state to that state and so on and so forth. Because at high temperature, you're, you're making more of these jumps more easily. But then as the temperature cools down, you're going to need more activation energy to exit these very deep uh, cavities, basically resulting in actually staying in a local maximum. So by having a high temperature initially, you're, you're able to get out of local maxima, but then by lowering the temperature as you go, you're sort of making sure that you eventually uh, stop at these um, uh, larger uh, global. So what you can do is effectively scale this Boltzmann factor that we saw earlier by the temperature. You're adding a temperature term in your Boltzmann machine. And you can do that by basically simply scaling the energy according to the temperature. And then you can vary the temperature, and this delta E that you're willing to tolerate at every step will basically become a fraction of that temperature. And if that ratio is you know, greater than some random number, then you're going to take that step. And then the smaller the activation, the, the, the lower the temperature, the more the activation barrier is before you can switch from state to state. So that's basically a temperature dependent training, which basically initially allows you to take bigger steps. And then as you go, take smaller steps. The next step after that is to start um, updating each of the units. So you now have this temperature, and now you'd like to update each of the units. How do you update each of the units? Well, as we mentioned earlier, updating all of them jointly requires computing this crazy gradient that depends on so many variables, which is very difficult to infer. Instead, what you do is this Markov chain Monte Carlo. You start with some kind of training vector on the visible, visible unit. You update all of the hidden units in parallel. And then you update all of the visible units in parallel to get a reconstruction. And then you update the hidden units again. Okay? You basically start with uh, visible units. And then you update each of them using only the local connectivity patterns for each of those units. And then, you know, based on these hidden units, you then re-emit these, you know, updated examples, and then you keep learning back and forth. And that allows you to now learn a function based on those. There are many additional tricks that you can use. You can basically constantly ask, how is my uh, probability changing with respect to each of the weights? You can basically sample both positive and negative examples because it's a generative model. You can generate positive examples and also generate negative examples. And you can basically use the two to discriminatively train based on things that are not in your uh, current uh, input set. There's another trick called the wake sleep algorithm where there's a positive phase, which is the wake phase. 
where you're basically clamping the visible units with the data, and then you use the input data to generate hidden activities. And then you sample the hidden state from this Bernoulli distribution. And then there's a negative phase where you unclamp the visible units from the data, and then you generate negative data by basically taking the opposite of what you would expect. And then you use this negative data to generate hidden activities that are negative. You're basically going back and forth between observing your data and then creating hidden activities and then ignoring your data and then generating negative data. Okay. So these are the two types of these neural networks. So you basically have these supervised learning networks based on this backpropagation algorithm that is constantly trying to adjust the weights to best predict a function that you're trying to achieve or a set of inputs. And then there's these unsupervised learning approaches where you basically are learning a set of relationships between variables in your uh, input set without necessarily having annotated example categories or uh, output levels for your data. And then there's this energy interpretation, which allows you to sort of carry out simulated annealing. You can sample without having to compute the entire uh, distribution. You can sample from that posterior distribution using Markov chain Monte Carlo uh, sampling. And then there's these two phases where you can either observe your data and then infer hidden activities from that, or you know, hide your data and then generate either positive or negative data from the hidden So these are sort of the more classical architectures. Over the last few years, there's been this incredible revival that has created additional architectures. So uh, one of them is an autoencoder, which is actually a very, very cool. Uh, System for actually turning um, supervised learning algorithm into an unsupervised learning algorithm, which is very, very cool. Uh, there's convolutional neural networks that allow you to sort of group together multiple regions of your input and then extract features from them using these convolutional filters and pooling. Um, and then recurrent neural networks that basically allow you to learn linear or temporal relationships, which can be very helpful in a uh, time series data or, for example, along the genome. Let's uh, dive into those. So what's an autoencoder? An autoencoder is basically saying, listen, my um, network is just so good at predicting almost anything, but I don't have any training examples. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to give it a cat as an input. I'm going to ask that it predicts a cat. It sounds trivial, right? You see a cat, you predict a cat. Like, you know, you see an image of a cat, and then you generate an image of a cat. But here's the trick. You constrain the model complexity. You basically have many, many, many input nodes, one for every pixel. You have many output nodes, one for every pixel. You're forcing your output to be exactly your input, but you don't give it that many pixels in the middle. By basically giving it fewer intermediate nodes, you're actually forcing it to learn a higher order representation or a lower dimensional representation of that input. Who's with me so far? Is this kind of a cool idea? Does this blow your mind? <laughs> yes. it, it, it blows your mind. This is just such a cool thing. And effectively, it'll be a very poor representation here in the middle, but it will learn the important features of a cat or of your input. It's effectively doing the same thing as before, where we're now, without any kind of supervision, we're able to learn representations of the data, abstract away from the raw pixels into representations, but we're doing this by basically tricking a supervised algorithm to work in an unsupervised way. Any questions? You can, there are tricks for actually getting your network to fire from those hidden layers and you can learn what was it learning. So, you know, there are many ways to actually extract information from what is currently, you know, very widely known as a black box. But these neural networks basically, from the set of weights that they've learned, you can actually get them to fire and then you're gonna learn what are these internal. Of course, this is just a cartoon, but you know, 
it's not going to spit out something like that, but you might see edges that sort of, you know, correspond to ears and a nose and a mouth and stuff like that. One way to make autoencoders work more easily is to actually pre-train them with these restricted Boltzmann machines and basically effectively learn representation for future supervised tasks. You can basically first run an uh, RBM, you know, all the way to here, and then actually, you know, give it the rest of the architecture as a way to sort of learn, um, you know, these intermediate steps in a more generalizable way. And after this pre-training, you can now unroll the RBMs, to basically create this deep autoencoder. So why is it called an autoencoder? Because you're basically, auto is because it has the same exact thing at the beginning at the end. And then encoder is because you're actually forcing it to encode it in this small set of uh, hidden nodes. And this intermediate in the layer, you create a bottleneck of information. Everybody with me so far? Is that me? So once you have this autoencoder, you can then fine tune it using backpropagation, which is again extremely powerful, but because you've sort of reduced the dimensionality here, you're sort of forcing it to learn higher order repetition. So that's the key idea of autoencoders. You basically do self-training and you're learning representations and you can also use RBM pre-training. What about convolutional neural networks? What they do is that they basically learn that if I have a blue pixel here in my image, chances are there's a blue pixel right next to it. And chances are there's another blue pixel right next to that. And so on and so forth. In other words, there's a lot of structure in these images. So even though you know, a deep, fully connected network can be extremely expressive, it becomes extremely hard to train on these massive, massive images with you know, millions of pixels. But because the images are structured and local, and they often consist of small parts where adjacent pixels are more related to each other than this one, you can actually start involving information from nearby pixels. You can basically start combining that information together. How do you do that? By basically applying convolutional filters. You basically have a set of pixels here. You're outputting a set of values here. But for every one of these values, instead of depending on only one pixel, that value here is going to depend on that pixel and all of its neighbors. Okay? So what I'm going to do is simply you know, multiply every one of these pixels with a scaling filter that I have, my convolutional filter, and then add up all of the results of this one. Okay? And that gives me a single number at the destination pixel which is basically convolving information from multiple nearby pixels. Who's with me so far on what this convolution operation does? Great. And then I basically apply the same filter A to a bunch of locations in the image in matrix form. You know, each of them is basically some kind of function of applying a set of weights to this and some base, you know, baseline. And then WI end up, ends up being you know, many, many copies of A. Space is sparse because it only applies to small regions. And then I slide that filter through, I apply it everywhere. And I can also have multiple input layers. For example, I could have uh, methylation information and here's modification information and transcription information all pertaining to the same region of the genome. Or I could have different channels. I could have an infrared channel and a red channel and a blue channel and a green channel in my image. I can basically have. Uh, filters that combine multiple inputs into one of them. And then again, the filters must apply to the entire depth of the image. And if the image is you know, D by uh, H, then every filter will basically have some size. But basically, when I get to the boundaries, I'm going to have to somehow you know, fill something out. And what people usually do is just fill it up with zeros. And then that you know, adjusts the, the fact that when I apply my filter at the edge of the, of the sequence, you know, I'm going to have to include information from here. Okay. Everybody with me so far on the boundary conditions here? Um, the other type of operations that you can have on these uh, convolutional networks is once you have uh, you know, multiple of these pixels coming out of the, your convolutional output, you can then choose to take the min, the mean, uh, or the max 
of that, uh, you know, you can take the sum, you can take the mean, you can take the max, you can take the min, um, to basically get to a lower dimensional representation. So instead of having an image with, you know, a million pixels, you can get to an image with a thousand pixels that perhaps summarizes that information. So, you know, you can basically pull things together and then combine these local regions into a single output, either by max or mean. And the benefits are basically you can then start learning hierarchical functions. You can basically have an edge here and an edge here and an edge here. And then when you, you know, sum them all up, you can just say, oh, wow, there's a sufficient number of edges. This must be a ball or this must be a tree or something like that. Uh, so the, the benefits are hierarchy, translation invariant, because if, if I fire here to the left or here to the right, by taking the max, it didn't matter where I fired. Uh, and it also you know, reduces the overall dimensionality of the data. And it also allows you to have nonlinearities. As we saw earlier, the nonlinearities were actually very important in uh, learning uh, for uh, these deep learning models. And then the nonlinearity here comes from the fact that you can apply a max operation. That's not a linear operation. You vary my input, and then the output will not vary. So the last type of architecture is a recurrent neural network. So then the idea here is that you're connecting uh, layers temporally next to each other. So basically for every time step, you have a set of inputs, hidden layers, and outputs. And then for the next time step, you have the same architecture, but now you allow connectivity from one time step to the other. That creates a layer of memory. So basically, if you've seen something, you now have a function that relates the next time step to the current time step. So that allows you to now start encoding linear relationships along either time or along the genome and so forth. So this can be very, very helpful. I mean, this actually has uh, been um, completely revolutionary for speech understanding. So in speech understanding, syllables uh, and, and phonemes and all of those sounds and other things that we make are in fact um, dependent on each other temporally. And you actually learn to anticipate the next one as the previous one is coming. So you have one of those actually turns out in your head, <laughs> uh, which basically is priming your auditory system for what are the sounds that are the next, you know, the most likely to follow current utterances that you have based on the model that you're learning of the world. And that has actually made it extremely, extremely powerful for uh, learning uh, speech, for understanding speech patterns and you know, doing voice recognition. You can actually talk to your phone, and your phone will actually transcribe what you're saying. And the other cool thing about that uh, is you may have seen uh, Gmail now does that. You start typing, and then it says, here's the rest of your sentence actually using this recurrent neural network within there. It basically learns the patterns of relationships between the current time point and the next time point. It's by having this edge here that Gmail is actually now able to predict what you're going to type next or to sort of create a reply for you on the fly. When somebody sends an email, you now have different replies. This actually learns both from many users as well as from your own behavior using these uh, recurrent Who's with me so far? Who feels that they've learned something? Yes, good, awesome. So what did we learn? We basically learned about supervised learning architectures. We learned about unsupervised learning architectures. And we learned about these new techniques for combining information, for making it serial, for combining structured information, for making things hierarchical and temporal and so on and so forth. Let's now turn to applying all that to DNA sequences. All right, so here's uh, the three applications that we're going to look at. We're going to look at the splicing code, not the slicing code, but the splicing code. We're going to look at regulatory grammars, and we're going to look at three-dimensional structures, which are three completely different um, domains of knowledge. So the first such um, program was basically uh, written in 2010, so eight years ago now, and basically sought to predict splicing patterns. How? By basically feeding the system raw sequence, exon, intron, and so on and so forth, 
and then extracting from 300 nucleotide bins features that were then convolved together into a prediction that allows you to say, is this going to be a spliced exome or not? Okay. So the feature sets were known motifs, the structure of a transcript in target exons and adjacent exons. And the output was basically whether a particular exon was going to be included or not. So basically, you know, probability of inclusion, probability of exclusion, and, uh, you know, probability of just not non-coding. Everybody with me so far? So basically what you're doing now is using all of this incredibly powerful learning architecture to predict things about the genome by giving it sequence. So how did this splicing code work? It basically had uh, only one uh, such hidden layer, and it had you know, uh, thousands of RNA and exon features. And then the output was a multi-output system rather than a single output variable, a multi-output variable. That was basically telling you, it, will this exon be included or not in the central nervous system, in muscle, in, embry you know, in the embryonic stages, and in digestive tissues? The number of hidden units followed some kind of Poisson distribution. The network weights followed the spike and slab prior, which basically means that uh, you either, so the spike is basically having you know, a very tall point, and then the slab is having a very flat surface. And spike and slab basically means that most of your distribution is going to be zero except for one point that's going to be very high probability. And then the likelihood was basically you know, trained using cross-entropy, and the network weights were sampled from that distribution. So uh, what's really cool with that is that it allows you to now start predicting which mutations in between individuals were going to be functional. Because you could then say, can I predict the same sequence output with the variant and without the variant? If I find a difference in splicing, I'm going to predict that this actually has an impact on splicing. So you can basically score the splicing change due to every SNP by basically training the splicing code model on tens of thousands of exons, predicting the three splicing classes over multiple human tissues using thousands of features, motifs, and RNA structures. And then you can score both the reference and the alternate sequence, harboring any one of hundreds of thousands of common variants. And then you can calculate the difference be, be, you know, between your prediction in the reference sequence and the prediction with using the mutation. And then you can basically find the largest uh, delta and then score the effect of a particular thing. Are you with me on this one? So then that allowed you to now start uh, you know, predicting effectively the, the impact of specific mutations, which they validated experimentally. So then those predictive scores were indicative of disease-causing mutations. You can basically sort of sort things based on known disease-associated mutations and then non-disease-associated mutations. <coughs> and you found that the delta in regulatory score was, in fact, much, much higher. And as I mentioned, the authors then went to actually validate their predictions using RT-PCR. And they found that, indeed, when they predicted that splicing would happen, they would do the experiment and the splicing would actually happen. So then, two years later, <coughs> this single hidden layer became multiple hidden layers. And now allowed them to learn, you know, uh, higher order relationships between these functions. There were several limitations. You required a threshold to define discrete splicing targets. It was not taking into account exon expression level in specific tissue types. It was using a fully connected uh, network, which basically imposed a huge number of parameters, so 13,000 parameters. And then, um, you know, it wasn't clear whether different uh, models would actually achieve. That. Also, their features were actually predefined, and thus may not completely reflect the underlying splicing and it was also not trivial to interpret which features were important. So that was the first model. It was you know, uh, quite a breakthrough at the time. And there's been many, many different models that have now uh, sought to solve um, slightly different problems, which is basically to predict whether a particular region will be regulatory or not, whether it will be um, 
bound by a particular transcription factor, and so on and so forth. So there's been a series of models for deciphering these uh, regulatory grammars. So how do these work? They basically use convolutional neural networks to basically model DNA sequence. Again, convolutional neural networks are those networks that allow you to sort of take multiple nearby pixels, in this particular case, multiple nearby letters of DNA, and then predict features from those. So the input matrix is effectively a vector of uh, it's a matrix where every input point is a vector of four values, which basically tell you which of the four uh, letters of DNA are observed in that point. And this is actually a binary vector, which is uh, a one only in one of the four characters and then a zero otherwise. In this particular case, you can see that the sequence is A, T, G, C, A, T, C, A, as you can see here, A, T, G, C, A, G, C, A, just by reading up here. So this is a matrix representation of DNA sequence. Everybody with me on this? So now you can actually start using convolutions. You can actually start combining and convolving together multiple nearby characters in the same way that in an image you can convolve multiple pixels to turn that into an edge. In DNA sequence you can convolve multiple characters to turn that into a motif. Here's one such example where your motif might be you know G C A or T G or G C W G. Okay? And then you can ask well where is that motif occurring in my sequence? And if you, if you score now that motif as you scan along your sequence, you're going to get a convolution output, which basically tells you where did that motif fire. This should look familiar because that's exactly the model we used last Thursday when we're talking about regulatory motif scoring. Only now it's in the context of this convolutional neural network. So in the first position, you know, this GC. W, G motif doesn't score very well. Second position doesn't score very well. But in the third position, it scores very well. And in the sixth position, it scores very well. Let's see why. So here's your underlying sequence. You basically have you know, A, T, G. So when that G starts and you run your G, C, A or T, sorry, A or G, G, you have G, great match, G, great match, A or T, great match, G, great match. Okay, so you now have convolved these particular, uh, you know, these four nucleotides, you've convolved them together using this convolutional filter. Which is represented. Who's with me? Awesome. Any questions? Awesome. So I'm now convolving this here, and then, oh, guess what? There's another match here. G, C, A, C A G that matches my motif again. Okay. So then as I as I run my convolutional filter, as I scan it past my matrix of input sequence, I basically have firings here and there. Sounds good? Great. So basically what's really cool here is that evolution can actually extract these invariant features from your sequence. You basically have this convolutional module that basically applies multiple convolutional filters. Each convolutional filter, in fact, represents a motif. And then you have a rectification. Remember this ReLU layer, so this rectifying linear unit, which is basically saying, did my motif score in any of these positions, for example? Did I have a motif score in this 50 nucleotide interval? And here, I basically have a pooling operation where I'm taking, for example, the maximum of these 50 positions, and I'm basically firing yes if that motif had a match. Doesn't matter how many matches, if it had a match, a score 50. Okay. It could also be a, a, mat, a, a plus operation. You could basically say just how many matches were there in that 15 of the So what's really cool here is that operations that are very standard to these convolutional neural nets are in fact exactly the same operations we would like to apply as biologists on the, on the genome basically counting motif occurrences or seeing if a motif is there or not. It's a very natural uh, interpretation of genomics. 
So rectification basically ignores the signals be below some threshold. So, you know, I don't need to have a score for every single position. I can just say zero, 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 zero. Oh, here it fired. And then that's where the different units of um, activation thresholds come in. So I could have a sigmoid that basically says, for all the zeros, I don't care at all. And then boom, it starts firing. Uh, and then it maxes out. I could have a softmax that again is zero everywhere. And then when it starts activating, it actually can go to as much activation as you need. I could have a relu, a rectify linear unit that basically scores zero if I don't see the motif. And then boom, as soon as I see the motif, I get the score of the motif above some threshold and so on and so forth. So that's the rectification. And then the pooling is that I summarize every channel by either taking the maximum or the average. Are you with me? So <coughs> you can now start doing prediction using the extracted features. So you basically have your convolutional module. And then once you have created the output of your convolutional module, you then feed it into your prediction module. So you basically run your representation learning, if you wish that extracts higher order features, it learns these convolutional filters from your sequence itself. It basically says, oh, this type of firing seems to be happening a lot. Let me encode this as a convolutional filter. And once you have that, you will basically have, you know, this particular motif firing. And now you can ask, well, is there a regulatory region in this particular location? And that will depend on multiple motifs. So then you can actually create these fully connected multi-layer architecture that allows you to now start combining multiple of these motifs together. And if two of them fire in a particular location, then that one might fire basically saying, you know, great, I have this motif or that motif, which becomes a grammar. And then you can have multiple layers with higher level combinations of these grammars at each point and then end up with the affinity of um, finding, for example, at one particular location. Who feels that they've learned something? Yes? Cool. All right, so that was one approach. Uh, so basically the you know, deep bind approach, uh, which basically you know, takes input from <clears throat> many different data modalities, and then, you know, uh, automatically learns uh, a model by including these convolutional filters, which are in fact learning different types of motifs, and then um, you know, predicting where are these motifs occurring, and then you know, rectifying, effectively applying a threshold or pulling together information from multiple locations, and then you feed that into a neural network, and then you use backpropagation to basically update your weights update your representations, and then predict effectively your uh, binding targets, predict whether a particular mutation will impact the regulatory code, and also predict whether a particular region will be regulatory or not. Everybody with me? All right, so this is now uh, also uh, applicable to, cre to creating a mutational map. You basically can have your reference sequence and your uh, alternate sequence observe a mutation in cancer or in a common variant and so on and so forth. What we can basically do is um, score your sequence as it is, and also rescore your sequence using a particular mutation. And then you can ask, well, what is the impact of that mutation on my predicted binding? And that allows you to immediately start predicting pathogenic mutations, predicting which mutations are more important to pay attention to. And you can directly from your convolutional filters basically infer sequence logos from uh, every one of them. So the key deep learning techniques in this second approach in deep binding was uh, convolutional learning, representational learning, which basically allow you to sort of learn higher level uh, representation, uh, back propagation and stochastic gradient, and then regularization where you're combining the output of multiple units by, and then also dropout in 
There was also a parallel GPU implementation that uh, was particularly useful for the hyperparameter search. But it also had some uh, limitations. For example, DeepBind required negative training examples because it's a discriminative algorithm. And these negative examples are very often arbitrary. So you just feed it you know, random sequences you hope is negative. But in fact, there might be stuff in there that buys it your training. It uses only the observed mutational data post hoc rather than as part of your model. And it also evaluates every regulatory data set Olga Toryanskaya and her lab uh, developed DeepC, which was another uh, deep learning model, which was similar to DeepMind, but it trained a separate convolutional neural network for every one of hundreds of different data sets. So rather than merging all these data sets together, basically had a different network for each of them, and then used the delta uh, of uh, score for every mutation as the input to then train a logistic regression linear classifier to predict GWAS variants. So it addressed the mutations in a very direct kind of way. So basically saying I'm going to prioritize mutations by learning what makes them important. So it used the power of the uh, neural network approach to specifically train it on recognizing true GWAS variants and then learning the features that set them apart rather than simply learning regulatory sequence and then learning it and then running it twice to basically see the difference. So then that allowed them to sort of increase the performance of actually predicting the uh, effect of mutation. Another uh, very elegant uh, model for modeling regulatory sequence was basically Bassett, uh, named after uh, the, the dog that is actually very keen uh, in being able to sort of learn a huge array of different smells. And then, uh, Bassett was able to sniff out motifs from the genome. I again had uh, 300 different convolutional filters which were learned automatically and a rectifying linear unit and a max pool operation that was basically looking at sort of where are different motifs firing. And then uh, a fully connected layer after that that basically allowed a linear transformation of these outputs to carry then out the prediction. And then this was a multitask prediction where it was simultaneously predicting DNA's binding sites in 164 different cell types. This is important because you're effectively sharing all of this underlying infrastructure of motifs that are reused in multiple cell types. So by learning these convolutional filters jointly across 164 cell types, you're effectively sharing information between the cell types, both positive and negative, terms of the motifs that are active in one particular uh, cell type or perhaps repressive um, in a particular cell type. So uh, this architecture basically outperformed uh, these tamer counting approaches, uh, which were uh, again very elegantly implemented in uh, GKM, SVM. And the motifs that were learned from these convolutional filters, in fact, matched many known motifs very accurately. There were also a lot of sort of degenerate sequence patterns, which were also learned. Uh, and then this indicates the importance of sequence composition in uh, regulatory sites. Another approach is com uh, Chromeputer. So from Anshun Kuldaji's lab, which is basically taking as input the DNA sequence, and then also the one dimensional DNAs or ataxic profiles. And then it has two layers. And what it's actually trying to predict is a multitask learning prediction of the binding of different transcriptional factors. So again, it allows sharing of motifs across many of these transcriptional factors, which are learned as these convolutional filters, and then applying them uh, in uh, this multitask framework enables you to basically say, well, make one binds when perhaps an analog is actually not there. I mean, it's always a moving target. So it depends on the metric you're using. It also interprets, it depends what you interpret by 85%. Uh, is that great or is that bad? So, um, Anshul's group also developed this uh, tool called DeepLift which basically allows you to infer 
what are these hidden layers truly telling us? And this was, as I mentioned earlier, taking this black box uh, interpretation of uh, neural networks and basically saying, well, they don't have to be a black box. I can just simply look at the deltas that I get in terms of my activation if I feed it different kinds of inputs and then learn from that what are the sequences that it actually recognizes. The key idea is that this rectifier linear unit is actually piecewise linear, and backpropagation differences of outputs using observed and referenced inputs, for example, inputs of all zeros, would allow you to obtain a gradient with respect to the input that would then allow you to figure out the importance of any input to any output by weighing the features by the input itself. So it's, it's a full trick for actually getting the network to sort of tell you more about its internal uh, uh, Jijiu Zhang uh, in my group basically developed um, a recurrent neural network to basically start predicting grammars of multiple regulator motifs and their relationship with each other by basically using the same principle as I mentioned earlier of learning the relationships not just at, at one location but also at the next location and basically learning something about the um, architecture of multiple motifs and the orders in which they are uh, occurring. And uh, another student in our group, uh, Thras, has actually been looking at three-dimensional structures, basically predict protein DNA interactions and also design new proteins or new enzymes or new drugs. The idea is that uh, he's actually using these deep neural networks to basically learn latent representations of protein structures. So you're basically feeding your sequence as, you know, just amino acid sequence. And what it's doing is actually learning higher order representations based on thousands of examples from existing databases of different types of domains. So the way that his system works, uh, it's called Comet, and it does a convolutional motif extraction at the protein space by basically having your input being a uh, one hot encoding of 20 uh, amino acids. Each one is a vector with only one one and 19 zeros basically feed that through a series of convolutional layers, which are actually learning different motifs by combining the sequence of multiple positions together, and then having a single firing that comes from, say, 25 different consecutive amino acids. And then you have a max pooling layer that basically says, hey, did I find a motif here or not? And then you have another uh, hidden layer of a sparse code that basically allows you to um, use that dimensionality, and then an unpooling layer, and then a deconvolution layer, which basically outputs your uh, amino acid sequence again. So what that's doing is effectively auto-encoding your protein sequences into the types of uh, motifs, protein motifs that uh, arise within them. So then you can exploit the latent representation of these protein structures to start classifying uh, the target DNA sequences of these. So the way that proteins contact DNA, as we talked about earlier, is extremely, extremely complex. But for some uh, proteins, there, there is actually a code that you can start inferring. And specifically for endonucleases, which basically contact the DNA and cut it. Uh, that's what Cas9 does in the CRISPR-Cas9 system. So it basically has an affinity for DNA, and it's able to actually go in and cut DNA. So what Thras is now trying to do is basically predict, if I run this on a huge database of proteins, and I predict new Cas9 proteins, for example, that will allow me to cut. So we talked about a lot of topics. We talked about supervised learning. We talked about unsupervised learning. We talked about neural networks and deep belief networks. We talked about autoencoders and convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks. And we also talked about some initial applications of these architectures in regulatory genomics, specifically predicting the splicing code, predicting regulatory grammars of binding of different constituent factors in different cell types, uh, accessible regions, and so on and so forth. And also going beyond the one-dimensional structure of the DNA to more of the three-dimensional folding of different proteins and then recognizing folds that will to DNA or bind to specific motifs or interact with other proteins and so 
The last thing I want to leave you with is that you don't have to, you know, pick up a blank sheet of paper and start coding to encode these architectures. There's basically a huge number of tools that allow you to now uh, define these deep learning models and then use them in very efficient ways. So there are uh, all of these deep learning models that I mentioned are actually implemented in multiple libraries. So you can have convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, uh, you know, deep nets, leaf nets, and so on and so forth. And then uh, the three main tools that people are using are Theano, TensorFlow, and Torch. They have different advantages and disadvantages for each of them. And then these libraries have um, many of the following features. They have automatic or symbolic differentiation on computational graphs by backpropagation. They actually compile your code for uh, you know, GPUs, and therefore enable speed ups that are uh, you know, very akin to this extremely highly optimized and parallel implementation of these core uh, neural network functions. They have, um, in addition to these very uh, low level systems, there are higher level systems of neural network libraries that wrap on top of the ANO and on top of TensorFlow and that simplifies the creation of neural nets. For example, Keras or uh, Lazar Gene are actually wrapping on top of that and enabling you to, to write these neural networks very quickly. And there's also more powerful GPUs, which are very easily accessible, and also cloud computing, which is also very easily accessible, which allows you to now start building more sophisticated, more powerful models by not having to rely on only what you can run on your laptop, on your desktop, or on your desktop, but you can actually have thousands of GPUs you know, if you want to run something that's much more involved. So here's one example that Alvin put together on using uh, deep, uh, deep learning, using this system, Keras, uh, for a one-layer convolutional neural network that has a binary output. Okay? So let's walk through it. So the first thing you do is you, know, you import Keras. And uh, you know, this will automatically import uh, Theano and TensorFlow uh, as well. And then you basically uh, do the following. So this is all Python code. So from keras.layers.convolutional, import convolution2d, max pulling 2d. From keras.models, import sequential model. From keras.layers.core, import activation, dense, dropout, flatten, permute, reshape, time distributed dense. Kind of cool, right? Like, you don't have to write all that. Uh, and then your input shape is 150 nucleotide uh, each time. This is one hot encoding and four letters, A, C, D, D, for DNA. You can have 20 of the protein. And then you're basically declaring your network architecture. So basically, and your training parameters. So um, the filter will be 10, your uh, convolutional height will be 15, Convolutional width will be four. Again, you know, these 15 long motifs. Your pool width and batch size are going to be five and a thousand. Your number of epochs is going to be 20. And then you're running this uh, sequential model. You're initializing this uh, CNN. And then you're adding this 2D convolutional filter that basically uh, uses all of these parameters that you just defined before. It's the convolution of four nucleotides, times, sorry, four ACGT, four letters times 15 nucleotides. Uh, you know, every offset of one, and then 10 filters for convolution. And then you're adding this activation, which is this uh, rectifier, uh, rectified linear unit. You're adding this max pooling of size one and the pool width, which was the single parameter before. And then you're flattening this model, and then you're outputting the nodes with dimension one. And then you're using a sigmoid because it's a binary output. So it's zero, 01, so you want it to be uh, zero, 01, and that's what the Sigmoid does very well. And then you compile it uh, using this Adam optimizer, and then you're using binary cross entropy as your loss function. And then you basically fit your model into a sequence X, basically have some training examples Y, you know, using the batch sizes and the number of epo epochs that uh, we talked about earlier. And then your predicted Y is simply you know, whatever your model predicts. So I think this is kind of cool. Are you ready to go and write your own CNN? All right. That's awesome.
Good. So we should give that away. All right. So uh, what we talked about today is supervised learning with traditional neural networks. So defining the perception, you know, putting them together in layers, using different types of activation units, sigmoid, softmax, and relu. Learning using gradient descent, rock propagation, uh, the rate of learning, choosing dropout, avoiding overfitting by having a training set, a test set, and a validation set. Unsupervised learning, so basically this is representation learning. This is not having a specific output, but this is learning the patterns of the input using deep belief networks. And we built them up from Boltzmann machines initially, and then restricted Boltzmann machines or RBMs, and then stacking those into multiple layers to create these deep belief networks. And then um, different ways of learning those. So basically understanding the energy uh, interpretation uh, of this probability function, and then simulated annealing by basically an allowing you to take very big steps at first and then smaller steps later on, and uh, keep sampling by basically going through and updating only part of your model each time to avoid having to do these huge gradients. And then these uh, wake sleep cycles that allow you to uh, hide your input and then construct um, new input from your hidden variables that can be used as negative examples and then um, hiding and then showing your input and then updating your hidden node based on that. We talked about several uh, modern deep learning architectures which are pervasive. So autoencoders, which allow you to do self-training and representation learning, and also uh, how we can pre-train those using stacked RBMs, to basically learn representation which can then be utilized in this higher order learning. Learned about convolutional neural networks, about how you can actually apply convolutional filters in your sequence and have these convolutional filters uh, capture, for example, edges or higher order features in an image or capture motifs in a genomic sequence. And then pooling, such as taking the sum or max of multiple uh, firings in the same location uh, nearby. And then recurrent neural networks that basically allow you to learn either linear or temporal relationships. And then we saw three different examples of applying deep learning in regulatory genomics. Number one, how you figure out the tissue-specific splice and code. Uh, and then how you can figure out different uh, regulatory grammars by basically learning motifs and their combinations and different architectures for doing that, different design choices with deep bind, deep C, and Bassett. And also how you can start inferring three-dimensional structural properties, such as uh, predictive species interactions and drug design. And then lastly, how you can actually start using that in a very practical setting and the code to actually implement a convolutional neural network that you know, studies uh, from the sequence. So in summary, neural networks can basically model very complex splicing patterns, regulatory elements, complex regulatory grammars, and protein structural domains. It can be used to predict tissue-specific alternative splicing, TF activity, sequence motifs, SNPs, the effect of mutations. Uh, we talked a lot about the algorithm foundations of fully connected neural network, convolutional neural networks, recurrent neural networks, energy-based models using Boltzmann machines, RBMs, deep belief networks, autoencoders. We saw different deep learning architectures, the CNNs, which are the most popular variant in genomics, given how natural it is for interpreting motifs and other such sequences, energy-based mo models, and also recurrent neural networks. And then uh, why these systems gained in popularity, basically the emergence of new algorithms, massive biological data, and also a lot of new compute power, uh, both CPUs and GPUs. And also we learned about the basic training algorithms of backpropagation, stochastic gradient descent, convolution, wake and sleep, dropout, and some computation. Great. Thank you all for coming. And then we'll see you again on Tuesday.